So we want to begin our discussion of uh, development, underdevelopment, uh, um, poverty in the world by discussing the, the sources of global inequality. And I'm focusing here on inequality, uh, but equally we could uh, frame the, ter the, the problem in terms of the sources of global poverty. Um, those are not exactly the same things, but uh, for our purposes, they get at the same set of problems. Some people in some parts of the world seem to be poor and enduringly poor, and it seems very difficult to solve. Uh, that situation, while others are wealthy and in some cases getting wealthier, creates um, inequality as well as poverty. So they're both problems, and they're linked. There's really two big debates. I'm simplifying here, of course, but there's really two big debates. Really, one is about the legacy of colonialism. Is the historical legacy uh, a big part of the explanation of why countries are poor today and of global inequality? or is it a small part? Uh, the second uh, a big debate is about is, is the market part of the solution or part of the problem? And, and as we're gonna see, those two debates are not completely distinct from one another. There's a, a fair amount of overlap. So the legacy of colonialism. So a standard argument uh, about colonialism, uh, obviously colonialism transferred immense amount of wealth from the global south to the north and so at the time of decolonization after World War II, colonialism had created the situation where some countries, right, the European countries, uh, North America and a few others were very, very wealthy and others were, were very poor. And the argument is that nothing was ever done to change that. That that disadvantage, uh, that inequality is something that the global economic system since that time uh, is really not set up to reverse or undo, and that just leaving it alone has just led the problem to remain or perhaps even to get worse. Put more concretely, there are those who say that the, uh, the effects of colonialism um, can't just be left alone to get better by themselves. It will take proactive, uh, actual steps to reverse them. One uh, particularly prominent school of thought in that vein is a school of thought known as dependency theory, which really uh, developed in, the, in Latin America in the 1960s and 70s as a way of trying to answer the question, right? Why uh, Latin America remained so poor? Why after World War II, it did not uh, develop the way a lot of people expected it to? Um, so, so this gets to the question then, to, you, to, to the extent that, the, that this is the argument that one believes, gets to the question of, okay, so what has to be done to reverse or undo the effects of colonialism? And whose responsibility is it to do it? Uh, unsurprisingly, uh, people who believe this argument tend to believe it's the responsibility of the former colonial powers to undo uh, the damage that they, that they did many years ago that still really, uh, in this view, endures. There's a completely different view of, of, of colonialism. Uh, unsurprisingly, this is a view that's probably more prominent in the North and wealthy countries uh, and among what you might call mainstream uh, contemporary economists. And the argument here is that um, colonialism ended decades ago, um, in some cases in Latin America, uh, centuries ago, um, and that there's been plenty of time to catch up since then. The problem from this perspective is not colonialism decades or centuries ago, but the policies that have been adopted since then. Uh, the states that have adopted uh, smart policies have done fine, and, and, and states that have developed bad policies have not done fine, and so to focus on uh, on something that happened many years ago uh, is really uh, missing the point of what the nature of the problem is. Um, related to this, then, is this question about the effects of markets, right? Um, one view of of, uh, of of this is that if you if you stick up a poor state or a poor actor in a competition. With, on a level playing field in a competition with a wealthy one, um, the poor country is never going to do very well, right? Wealth produces more wealth. The wealthy countries can invest more in technology. They can invest more in education, like you're all getting. Um, they have more consumers with money who can buy products. And so there's this, there's this um, sense that having poor countries compete with rich countries uh, in, a, in what seems like a fair competition is not fair at all. Um, the solution that many people have advocated historically 
is to insulate developing country markets from competition uh, from the advanced societies so that they can grow on their own without competition from powerful, wealthy co uh, companies, um, what is sometimes called infant industry uh, protection. This is a, a famous argument that's been made. Those of you who are friends uh, of the musical, or fans, I should say, of the musical Alexander Hamilton uh, may be aware that Hamilton was someone who advocated this argument for the early United States. Um, there's a much more favorable uh, view of the effects of markets for development. And this is the argument that markets help economic development. In markets, capital gets allocated rationally and efficiently, and so it has its biggest impact. That competition creates a stimulus for financial discipline and for innovation that leads to economic growth. Uh, and as we've talked about when we talked about globalization, it's the notion that markets provide access to global capital. So that if you don't have money to invest in technology or education and so on, um, that markets, uh, global capital markets, allow you access to that. And so uh, this, the standard argument really, uh, to put it simply in this perspective, is that underdevelopment or poverty is not the result of the market, it's the result of the absence of the market. Uh, and, and there are you know, various, especially the, the countries known as the Asian tigers are often pointed to uh, as, as evidence that if you have the right policies, you can get rich uh, in a fairly short period of time. So essentially what we're talking about here, if you haven't figured it out yet, is, is a kind of central debate, economic debate between economic structuralism on the one hand and liberalism on the other. Economic structuralism seeing uh, the effects of colonialism as being enduring and seeing the market not as a part of the solution, but part of the problem. Liberalism, uh, um, not necessarily having a good view of the effects of colonialism. Liberals were very anti-colonial, uh, but liberalists, uh, liberals arguing um, that the cure really, that there's no way to undo what was done 200 years ago other than to adopt good policies now. And liberals would argue that if they had the right policies, there are some factors that will make poorer countries um, inherently competitive, namely whatever their local com comparative advantage is, but also the fact um, that because they're poor, their labor will tend to be cheaper, and that over time, uh, if the market is brought to bear, um, a demand for that labor will bid up the price of labor in poor countries till it reaches that of the wealthy countries. And of course, the economic structuralists are pretty skeptical of that. We'll, we'll continue this discussion.